This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is brought to you by the UK team behind the Artisan Beta Cut pruning products. Still largely undiscovered by the UK market, they've recently been discovered by Selfridges in May of this year, and they're now stocked there. The Beta Cut brand is the sign of excellent craftsmanship using traditional hot drop forging methods with the handmade cutting tools made in Urba, Italy, near the banks of Lake Como. Beta Cut has been a leader in providing steel cutting blades since 1955 and offers gardeners handcrafted products for those seeking that unique and traditional alternative. As a special offer for listeners, Beta Cut is offering 20% off all orders placed via the website and the code expires on Wednesday and I can fully recommend the 805 model. I've been using them and they're an awesome bit of kit. Visit the link in the show notes and enter the code ROOTS20, all uppercase, at the checkout. This week I'm speaking with Dr Sandy Primrose about his brilliant book Modern Plant Hunters, which tells the stories of plant hunting in more recent times. Who's doing it, why and what they're looking for. Find out about the challenges plant hunters past and present have faced, whether you can do it in somewhere like the UK, and the kind of qualities and personal traits you might need if you want to start. And spoiler, it's not for the faint-hearted. Here's our conversation. My first question is, why do people go on plant hunting expeditions in this day and age? Are there still things to find? Well, there's, there's actually four groups of people who go plant hunting. The two biggest groups are the scientific institutions and the people, usually people who are running uh, plant nurseries where they're growing, you know, the more unusual, supplying the more unusual plants. Uh, these are the two big groups. Uh, and if we start with the scientific institutions, people like Kew Gardens or the uh, Edinburgh Botanic Gardens or the New York Botanic Gardens, they do it really for two basic reasons. They're going to try and save endangered plants. And there are, I mean, about 40% of the world's plants are endangered. So they go looking for new plants uh, that might be endangered, or particularly if they have a, a potential medical or food benefit. But they also go looking for plants uh, usually from known plant families, because they're looking for diversity. Uh, and a good example would be, say, tomatoes or potatoes, where they go out looking for members of the, to- the tomato and potato family so that these can be bred in to existing varieties of these crops so that we can get new varieties that might be drought-resistant or heat-resistant or disease-resistant and so on. So that's the two bits from the science scientific institutions. When we come to the the, the, the more amateur collectors who are often running um, plant nurseries, they are basically going out looking for new garden-worthy plants. And I think it's interesting. I mean, I've been a keen gardener for about 45 years. And in the last 25 years, there's been lots of new plants have come on the market. Lots and lots. Some of these have come about from plant breeding, but a lot of them have come from new collections from the wild. Um, now, the people who do that, they're actually doing it simply to get new variety into the gardens, but actually they're playing a big part in conservation because very often the plants that they bring back a few years later become extinct in the wild because usually because of building or if they've got a food or medicinal use because of over collection. So that's the two big groups and the biggest by far are the scientific institutions. But then you get two other groups that go out plant collecting. The first of these are the, pl- the people who go out hunting in orchids, and I'm not referring here to the scientific institutes that collect, like Q that collect orchids, but the amateur orchid collectors, and usually they are really wild. They're really, uh, the madcap are hunters. They go after anything they'll take risks and so on. They are just obsessed with orchids. So they're quite a special breed. And then there's the last group, which I call the botanical tourists. 
And these are people who just want to go and see and possibly to photograph particular plants in the wild. Uh, and they do no harm at all, really. They just go, they photograph, and they come back. So these are the four groups of people that go plant hunting today. But by far the biggest are the people from the uh, botanical gardens and other scientific institutes like the Department of Botany at Oxford University. In your book, you talk about an absolute multitude of challenges that these people face when they are out on these expeditions. Um, But in your opinion, what are some of the main challenges that, that they come up against when they're either undertaking the trip itself or planning it? Well, today, really in the last, 20 years, 15, 20 years, the biggest challenge has been legislation, particularly CITES and the Nagoya Protocol. They've really cut back, particularly for anyone who's an amateur, like from the um, plant nurseries and so on. The big institutions have got the people in place to do all the necessary paperwork and so on. But legislation still is a big big barrier. But there are personal hazards if you do decide to go out there and they vary I mean they vary from things like you know if you go into the Himalayas or anywhere in the tropics you know think animals like leeches and snakes are a constant hazard uh, also in many parts of the world and particularly Mexico South America Southeast Asia bandits and particularly uh, drug runners and drug smugglers. Uh, I mean, quite a few of the plant hunters have run into them and you are lucky to escape with their lives. Uh, And then the other bit you get in certain countries is just corrupt officials. Doesn't matter if you've got the right paperwork and so on, they're looking for bribes and if you upset them, that's it. They run you out the country and it doesn't matter how much money you've spent, your plant hunting's over. So that's the kind of challenges you face. And I say to people, you know, when they talk about it, I said, you know, anyone who goes out plant hunting, particularly in places like Southeast Asia and the Himalayas and so on, where you're having to battle, you know, uh, dreadful humidity, heat, uh, leeches, snakes, and all sorts of other things, really... Anyone who does it and can enjoy plant hunting in these conditions really would make an ideal member of something like the SES or other special forces. You need that kind of uh, spirit, I think, to go out and collect. I certainly wouldn't want to go collecting in places like the Himalayas. I don't think I would cope very well at all. No, me neither. And I take my hat off to them, I have to say. Um, And you mentioned the CITES and uh, the Nagoya Protocol. Um, They've changed, obviously, the way the plants can be collected and transferred across borders. Can you briefly explain the constraints that they impose and and what is your opinion on it? Is it a good thing or is it, you know, is it kind of hamstringing people? Well, very interesting. CITES in particular, uh, I mean, it stands for the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And when it talks about international trade, it doesn't necessarily mean selling things. It means just moving them across international borders from one country to another. Now, I'm quite a critic of CITES. And in fact, the book... um, Q uh, Publishing were very interested in the book, but wouldn't publish it because of my comments in the book about CITES, and they're a big public institution, so they've got to be careful here. I mean, CITES, the principles behind CITES, nobody could criticize. It's all about conservation of endangered species. And it really started out to protect animals, things like rhinos, um, you know, for their horn or elephants for their tusk and so on. These animals are endangered in the wild because people poach them just to get their hands on the horn, as I say, or the tusks and so on. And the thing about these animals is, generally speaking, they're big animals and it's relatively easy, and I say relatively here, easy to count them and to know how many they are and to spot what's happening to them. So as far as animal protection goes, I couldn't possibly criticize CITES. My criticism comes when CITES is applied to plants. Plants. 
because if you look at the list of protected plant species, about 80% of them are orchids. All orchids are covered by CITES, whether they are rare and endangered or not. And that doesn't make sense. Now, of course, it's much harder to try and estimate how many orchids there are of a particular species. But bearing in mind that orchids produce large amounts of seed, you could hold in your hand a billion orchid seeds. They're so small. So there's loads of seeds there. And modern collectors don't actually collect plants. They collect seed. But nevertheless, CITES applies not just to plants, whole plants, it applies to plant parts. It even applies to dried specimens that are in herbaria, which is crazy. So you can't necessarily move uh, seeds even. And the problem is we don't know how many of these plants are actually endangered and how many aren't. So it makes a kind of mockery of the whole thing. And I think CITES has been applied too much like a sledgehammer. And the other problem that goes with it is when, if I were to take a plant and move it across borders, I might be stopped by customs and ask me about it. I could be um, arrested under CITES legislation, and the people arresting me have not a clue what that plant is. I mean, there's no way customs officers can know all the plants. So in the UK, the CITES authority is Kew Gardens, which makes sense. But even then, you know, it's very, very difficult. So it's applied as a very blunt instrument. It's even been applied to people who are moving herbarium specimens from one country to another and plan to return them. And that's stupid. So I think CITES for animals is fine. For plants needs a complete rework. But I don't see it happening any time soon. Now, the Nagoya Protocol is a different thing altogether. And this is really was brought in to stop uh, big countries uh, getting a plant of economic importance from one country, a poor country, and exploiting it for commercial benefit in a rich country. Uh, and a good example here would be a, a plant known as Hudia gordonii, which is actually a, a kind of cactus. And this plant has long been used by the indigenous populations of South Africa. And they used it for treating indigestion and infections and so on. But the greatest interest in this plant has been a use by the San people. Uh, for centuries they've used it as a means of suppressing appetite when they were making long hunting trips in the Kalahari Desert. And people thought, wow, this is great. appetite suppressant, this would be great to try and uh, give to people who want to lose weight. Now, of course, you could see what happens. A big pharmaceutical company could come in, take that plant, exploit it, and then the sand people would get nothing for it at all. So it's to stop that kind of thing that um, the Nagoya Protocol came in. And interestingly enough, what happened with uh, Hudia was the South African government filed patents on it, and then they would give out licenses to people who wanted to, to work on it. Uh, and again, to stop it being completely um, becoming extinct in the wild from people collecting it, they actually set up nurseries so that they could grow this cactus. For in commercial scale. I mean, the unfortunate thing is, uh, it turns out that uh, all the drug companies dropped the use of it, I suspect because they found it was toxic. The sand people only take it for three or four days, but people who want to lose weight would be taking it for many days, maybe months, and that's when toxicity showed up. But nevertheless, that was a way of um, stopping, you know, unfair commercial exploitation. So again, on that side of Nagoya, I have no problem. It makes sense. And in fact, it's just decent uh, behavior, if you like, in the part of rich nations. The problem comes if I go out and I go collecting, say, in Thailand, and I find a new plant that might be a garden-worthy plant, I have to get 
uh, rights from the Thai government under the Nagoya Protocol to sell that. Now, if I decide to sell it from my plant nursery, I might be lucky to sell about three or four hundred pounds worth in a year. Doesn't matter. Still covered by the Nagoya Protocol. And the countries want you to sign up to all sorts of paperwork. It becomes no point in doing it. And as I said earlier, the thing about people from nurseries who go out plant collecting, they actually are doing conservation uh, in their own right, but that doesn't get credited to them. So Nagoya works against uh, plant collecting as well. And I've noticed that of the modern plant collectors um, whom I interviewed when writing the book, most of them in the last few years have stopped going plant hunting, which I find very sad. But, you know, that's reality. You know, not a lot you can do about it. No, no, it certainly sounds like an absolute minefield. Um, who are some of the most prominent plant hunters that are working today out of the UK? Uh, do we still send people out or do they still go out under their own steam to collect plants? There's very few I'm, I know of in the UK. I mean, ones that I were doing it a few years ago, like um, Sue and Bledenwyn Jones from North Wales, uh, who run uh, Creek Farm Plants. They haven't been out for a few years. Ken Cox from Glendale Gardens hasn't been out for a few years and so on. Of course, COVID will have stopped it as well, but I'm talking pre-COVID. So it's really now only the institutions that are sending out plant hunters. I mean, Q will always send out plant plant hunters, and it's got them in various parts of the world. So institutions will always do it because that's part of their mission. I mean, all the uh, botanic gardens uh, belong to a, an organization called Botanic Gardens Conservation International. I mean, this is actually based uh, at Kew, but not with it, just in the outskirts of Kew Gardens. Uh, and what it's done is it's got all the big botanic gardens focused on three key areas of conservation. One of these is medicinal plants. So these are plants, obviously, that have properties you can use to treat sickness. They also focus on plants that they say contribute to human well-being. And that's plants that might improve nutrition or alleviate financial pro uh, poverty, provide community and social benefits, and so on. And then the third thing is plants that affect livelihoods. So they can be used, they can be traded and you know, promote the use of indigenous plants for health, eating these kinds of things. So all the botanic gardens, large and small, uh, belong to Botanic Gardens Conservation International. And they will continue to do plant hunting because uh, it's part of the remit, as I said earlier, partly for conservation of endangered species, but also, actually, they're still looking for the diversity. So they'll continue to do it. How many of the more amateur people will do it, I just don't know. But I know from talking to some of them, Nagoya was just the last straw, I think, in their plant hunting. Yeah, I mean, it, I suppose it did. It was a little bit like the Wild West um, when people were plant hunting historically. If you look back through history, is there a plant hunter that you particularly admire? Yeah, well, actually, on the point you've just said there, it was a bit like the Wild West. It certainly was. Uh, and two cases that would put it in perspective. I mean, Ernest Wilson, who was one of the great uh, plant collectors uh, from the golden era of plant hunting. I mean, on one occasion, he was in China and he saw he was in a meadow and it was just filled with um, Lilium regalium flower. And he and his helpers planted stakes uh, adjacent to 600 of these plants so that when the plant died down, they could go back and collect the tubers, 600 tubers. Now, nowadays, that is just not allowed. First of all, you wouldn't take the tuber, you would try and take the seed. And if you did take the tuber, you would take one. But in these days, take anything. The orchid hunters were even worse because when orchid mania was at its height, 
um, a collector would go out, uh, usually working for an orchid nursery, he'd go out to collect new orchids. And if he found them, he'd collect as many as he could. And then what he couldn't bring back, he would destroy the remainder so that rival collectors couldn't get their hands on them. I mean, that really is the Wild West. Mm. Um, but if I look back at the, the plant hunts, do I admire? Actually, I admire all of them for the sheer hardships they went through. I mean, the stories I've got and the stories from the golden age of plant hunting, the people like Ernest Wilson and George Forrest and Robert Fortune and so on, Frank Kingdon Ward. I mean, dreadful hardships and things they went through. But I, I guess my, my, the ones I most admire well, of the, from the golden age, it would be um, George Forrest because, you know, he escaped death uh, in Tibet under the most horrific circumstances. He was hunted for days and ended up crossing the Himalayas at 20, nearly 20,000 feet and with his shoes and tatters. And despite all that, he went back collecting again and again. I think it put me off the first time, but not him. In the modern day, Michael Wickenden, the late Michael Wickenden, unfortunately died out in Southeast Asia a few years ago. Michael, he was he could be a cantankerous character. I met him on several occasions, but absolutely dedicated and principled, and the only modern collector who's actually collected in all five continents. And he tended to go out very much on his own. I mean, the institutional collectors very often will go out and have anything up to 40 um, assistants with them, usually locals, to help carry bags and pack stuff and so on. Michael did it all mostly in his own with just one or two porters. So he did it really, really the hard way. And I guess the third sort of what I admire is, you may have read his story, Tom Hart Dyke, who was collecting orchids and got captured by fart gorillas in the um, in Central America, just very close to Colombia. I mean, Tom's interesting. He went out really as just an innocent young man in adventure, and of course got caught up by gorillas and held captive for many months. But I've got to admire the sheer the sheer uh, guts he had and his way of dealing with these his captors uh, his captor, captors rather he, he just brilliant so I admire them, all of them but I certainly wouldn't do it Neither would I, having read your book it's put me right off, but that said is it possible to plant hunt in the UK? It might be, I'm thinking it might be slightly less intrepid It, it is certainly less intrepid uh, the the, the, the biggest thing you have to is you go to Scotland, you have to fight the midges. They're probably about the worst thing you could deal with in plant hunting in the UK, Scottish midges. The problem with Britain in general is we have a very small natural flora. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but it's a very small number. And um, it's incredibly rare for anyone to find anything new. So... If you want to go planting, yeah, you could go looking for some of the rare orchids. Just don't collect them. And some people do that. Um, I mean, one of the orchids that some people go looking for is one known as the ghost orchid, which you only get in forests. Uh, and it only appears briefly. And you see it, and then it might not be found in that location ever again. Or if it is, it might not be for 20 or 30 years. And nobody knows what, why. It comes and goes, but some people will go looking for that, and you could spend years before you see it. But other than things like that, there's not much of great interest in the UK. So, yes, you can go plant hunting. I'm not sure you'll find very much. <laughs> yeah, I did interview Peter Marin, actually, who's got a book out about his journey trying to find the ghost orchid, which I'm, I think I'm not going to give much away, but he didn't find it. Uh, but he sort of went on more of a personal quest to see all of the wildflowers in the UK. So it wasn't su as such collecting, it was more observing, but that was still interesting. Um, but if anyone was interested in getting into plant hunting, what advice would you give them? Well, first of all, I say that about orchids, that there are people who've gone out looking for every UK orchid and they've found them, but it's taken them a fair, think there's a fair time to do it. But going back to your question, advice to anyone interested in plant hunting, first of all, ask yourself, do you really want to do it? 
And why do you want to do it? Because if you don't have a good reason, you'll actually not find it very successful. Um, you have to ask yourself, can you tolerate hardship? You know, uh, heat, rain, you know, biting insects, snakes, leeches, whatever it is, wherever you go. And it doesn't matter which continent you go to, you'll probably find something that is very, very unpleasant. And that's if you're going to look for the really difficult things. So you have to ask yourself first, why, why, why? And then if you're still convinced you want to do it, my advice would be go and talk to some of the people who've actually gone plant hunting. And probably the best place to go to would be some of the the um, collectors of ornamental plants from the plant nurseries because they go out generally unsupported by big teams. So they can tell you what it's really like. And then if, you know, and do you still want to do it? They'll give you tips of where to go, of what to take, what not to take and so on. And then the other thing is, are you going to look for any particular plant or not? That's something you need to decide before you go because if you don't, you know, you'll just go on a nameless task and you won't find anything. Another thing you have to think about is how much do you know about plant taxonomy, you know, the classification of plants? Because I know a lot about plants. I could go out looking for new plants and I could pass them by and not know whether a plant I found was rare, unusual, new, or anything like that. And I have to admire the people who go plant hunting and can recognize almost instantly they found something different. You know, that's a real skill and you have to know your plant families exceedingly well. Um, I mean, Bledon Wynne Jones from Creek Farm Plants, he spent years studying plant taxonomy before he went plant collecting. You know, it's, it's not a, a skill you pick up overnight. And then the last thing is, you're going to have to know all about CITES and the Nagoya Protocol and work out how you're going to handle it if you're not going to bring plants back illegally. And possibly the last thing is, if you are going to bring plants back as opposed to just looking at them, you need to make sure that um, you've got clearance or you've got assistance from uh, our own Ministry of Agriculture because uh, DEFRA, because you can't just bring plants back in case you bring disease. So if you want to go plant hunting, there's an awful lot of work you have to do before you go. And in fact, if you want to do a one-week trip or a four-week trip, you'll probably spend a year, if not more, actually preparing for going. Mm. And quite a bit of money, I imagine. Yes, it's it's not cheap. It's not cheap. Um, I mean, you, what you can find is that, for example, you might say you're going to go somewhere in the Himalaya. You could fly to India, say, and get a relatively cheap flight. But once you get to India, the internal flights can cost you 10 times what it costs you to get to India. You know, and it's that kind of thing. I think it's fascinating. I think we've got to give a, a lot of credit to all the plant hunters, at least the institutional ones and the, the, uh, the ones from the plant nurseries and so on, the more amateur ones, the collectors of the ornamental plants, because they've done us a fantastic service. They're doing the world a fantastic service. And if you look back uh, and say, well, you know, what has plant collecting really done for us? Uh, I mean, there's one good example, I think, that many people don't know about. Probably one of the greatest plant hunters that most people have never heard of is a Russian called Nikolai Vavilov. And he is one of the great uh, agricultural geneticists and botanists. And he traveled the world and collecting plants and identifying where plants originated from. And he put together a massive collection in uh, St. Petersburg. In fact, during the Second World War, um, Hitler had given orders to his troops invading Russia to get that he wanted them to get their hands on that collection because he considered it so valuable. And Vavilov's people hid that collection. Um, but the interesting thing about it is, in 1991, after years of war and famine, Ethiopia's wheat crops had been uh, 
completely destroyed, and they were able to re-establish the original varieties of wheat in Ethiopia using the seed that Vavilov had collected back in the 1920s. And I think that just is testament to what collecting can do. And it may be now that we've got war again in Ethiopia, that may be needed to be done again. You know, that's the kind of thing I think which is absolutely crucial. Um, and, you know, there's areas which I think really would benefit from a lot of work and aren't happening. And I think what's sad, so for example, uh, one of the things that Vavilov did was he established that apples originated in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia. Now, the reason he worked that out was when he went to Kazakhstan, he found forests of apples, apple forests, and every tree had a different kind of apple on it. So it's huge diversity, and that says this is where they originated. And he found apples that tasted like pineapples. He found ones that were sweet and ones that were be- all sorts of properties. And the trouble is that uh, Kazakhstan now is developing rapidly, and these forests are being cleared. So varieties of apples that could be useful for all sorts of purposes are now being lost. And that's, you know, that's what's happening to so, so many plants that are endangered because of modern development. And that's very, very sad. And one person who's trying to fight this kind of thing is uh, in Q. There's a, a, a man in Q who's very, very keen on his studies coffee, Aaron Davis. And he has found all sorts of novel coffee plants. And the key thing about it is most of the coffee that we drink today comes from just two um, species of uh, coffee plant plus a hybrid. And with global warming, these varieties may not survive mass culture. So he's been finding new varieties which could keep us drinking coffee well into the future. So, you know, this underscores just the importance of going plant hunting. You know, it's trying to do these good things because we didn't let any plant die out, really. Now, you might say, well, I found a a lesser spotted buttercup, you know, and it's rare. I've only found one of it. Does it matter if we lose that plant? Well, it may not lose. It might not matter at all. But on the other hand, how do we know it's not important? And one of the examples that I give to people of why it's so important to keep all our plants is you'll be familiar with the Brazil nut. You know, it comes these big chunky nuts. Now, the Brazil nut comes from a tree that grows in the Amazon forest. And the tree produces, uh, the, the nuts are actually produced inside um, a structure very much like a coconut, a very hard structure. Now, in order to produce the nuts, the Brazil nut tree has to be pollinated by euglossine bees. Now, these aren't the kind of bees that you find in, in hives we do for honey making. These are bees that are solitary. Now, in order to reproduce, a male bee is only allowed to mate with a female bee if he has visited a particular orchid beforehand. If he hasn't visited that orchid, the female bee will not allow him to mate. So suddenly, you know, we want to have Brazil nuts. You cut down a Brazil nut tree or you destroy the forest. If you replant Brazil nut trees... In order to get them to produce nuts, they have to be pollinated. You have to have the bees, but you can't have the bees in the hives because they're solitary bees, and you have to have the orchids. Suddenly you realize there's a huge ecosystem here, and there's many, many, many examples of these. So allowing a plant to die out can be a very dangerous thing because it might have all sorts of knock-on consequences that we just don't know. So, you know, trying to decide what ones need to be saved uh, is difficult. Uh, I mean, there are guidelines that um, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature uses, but, you know, these are the reasons why we have to keep plant hunting. So, all you brave souls out there, we need you. Thanks very much to Dr Sandy Primrose for sharing his passion about plant hunting and thanks to you for listening.
Also, thanks go to BetaCut for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget you only have until Wednesday to use the discount code ROOTS20 to get 20% off. Now it's Dr. Ian Bedford with an insect that even I struggle to love. When I'm in bed, the lights are out and I'm just about to drift off and one starts whining around my head. If there's one group of insects we're likely to despise more than any other that we see in our gardens, it'll be the flies that bite us. And in particular, the mosquitoes. A ubiquitous family of flies that hunt primarily warm-blooded animals to steal a bit of blood and whose bite causes itching and discomfort, often for many days afterwards. But why do these unpleasant little creatures want our blood? Since they won't ingest it, as they only feed on plant juices and nectar. Well, it's all to do with the females, who unfortunately have to fill their bodies with blood to nourish their eggs, which won't develop inside them without being bathed in this protein-rich fluid. And over the past 200 million years, they become very adept at finding and collecting this blood. The female initially searches for potential prey by tracking down the source of carbon dioxide and skin odours that she detects from up to 100 foot away. Then using her eyes and heat sensors, she'll home in and gently land on the exposed skin of her victim into which she pushes her proboscis and injects saliva that not only numbs the entry point but prevents clotting when she taps into a blood vessel and fills up her body. She'll then rest up for a few days, waiting for around a hundred eggs to develop inside her, before she flies off to lay them in a small pool of still or even stagnant water where they'll hatch into little aquatic larvae that feed on algae and detritus before emerging as adult mosquitoes two weeks later. Despite being a bit of a nuisance here in Britain, mosquitoes are nowhere near as problematic as some of the species that exist in warmer parts of the world, where they're responsible for transmitting more diseases than any other animal. Diseases that cause some of the most serious illnesses known to us and result in millions of deaths each year and which mean finding effective and sustainable ways to control mosquitoes remain key objectives in our ongoing battles against global infectious diseases. But whether it's reducing the risk of being bitten here in our gardens, or being infected with a serious disease in a tropical country, the basic principle of mosquito control remains similar. To cause a break in their life cycle either by blocking or repelling them from acquiring blood, or by removing anything unnecessary that could hold water long enough for their larvae to develop in, such as discarded cans and bottles. Yet we can also now live in hope that the incredible ability of modern-day science and medicine to overcome adversity will before too long allow us to deal with the menace of mosquitoes and the diseases they vector once and for all. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All podcast. 